Good evening. I'm so glad you could join me this evening as we continue our series, Love in the Torah. We're going to be in Genesis uh, 49 tonight, so if you would, get your Bibles uh, open to that chapter. We're going to be reading a good portion of this chapter. It's a fantastic chapter. Uh, so much in it, we're not going to be able to cover it all for sure, uh, but uh, it is going to be pretty exciting. So I, I'm, I'm excited about it, so I hope you are too. Hopefully you found your Bibles so we're just going to open in some prayer uh, and prepare our hearts for tonight's uh, word from the Lord. Avinu Shabbat Shemayim, our Heavenly Father. We are so grateful for this time that we have to study your word. I ask, Lord, that your spirit would be upon each and every one of us, that as we look into uh, your word today, uh, that uh, there would be revelation of your truth of your heart towards man, uh, what you have for us, Lord. It is an awesome thing uh, to have access to your word. And we thank you that uh, in this time, in this season, that we have it and that we are able to engage it and dig deep uh, so that we could see your wonders and how magnificently you knit your word together for our good, for our benefit, and for our blessing, and for our life, Lord, and expression of love that you have given us. So we bless you, we thank you for this time, and we turn it over to you, and we ask for your guidance. In Yeshua's name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so like I said, we're going to be in Genesis 49. We are quickly approaching the end of the book of Genesis. Um, it is an exciting book, and uh, there's only one more chapter left. Uh, so here we are about to enter in, well, I, I, I'm excited. I want to get ahead of myself. Um, we're, we're, we're seeing how, let, let's reflect on this book of Genesis real quick. Um, it, uh, it starts with the words Bereshit. In the beginning, uh, God spoke. He spoke all things into creation. It, it resonates of the presupposition that God exists, that he always exists, and that there was a beginning to his creation. And then he spoke everything into existence. Uh, and by his word, by that power within him, uh, all things came into being uh, through him and through what he spoke. And uh, we're going to see something cool here at the end of this book, how there are ends and beginnings. So um, before we get going, I probably should have done this backward as I was putting it in my um, PowerPoint. Uh, but we're just going to take an overview real quick of one of the neat um, things noticeable about what happens in this chapter. Uh, first off, this is Jacob speaking over his sons. You may have a title in your Bible that says, Jacob blesses his sons. And this is where he is calling all of it. We're going to read it. But he's calling all of his uh, sons together so that he might speak a word over them, a very prophetic word in, a, in actuality uh, about who they are, uh, what uh, ho life holds for them, and more about their, their characters. Um, we're going to see how that influences everything. But there is, this is a um, poetic book, or poetic chapter, excuse me, um, written in uh, poetic form. And uh, there is, in fact, it's not the first time poetry is used in, in the Bible, but it is the most extensive time right now. It's very uh, long. It's the whole chapter. It's 20, some, uh, 30, 20, 24 verses. Um, but it's listed out and it's, and it's spoke in poetry uh, and it's spoken over these, these children. Uh, one of my first, uh, I like to step back and see a big picture, what might be happening in the book. And of course, there's a list of the names and something came out as I started to write down the names and write down who the mothers were. I like to put all this information uh, out there. And it came out that the first group um, of children that are listed are Leah's. Um, and I'm just going to lay this out here real quick. The next group we see that there is Bilha and Zilpah. Now those are the maidservants of Leah and Rachel. Remember that uh, they lay at one point stopped giving uh, a stop uh, having children, and so she gave Bilha to 
Jacob to have children and, and Rachel was not having children. So she gave Zilpah to Jacob to have children through them. So Bilhah and Zilpah uh, children are listed in this order as they come down through. We're going to see all the names here in a bit. And then there's Zilpah and Bilhah again in the, in the ordering. And finally, Rachel's children. Um, at the end of, of this blessings and, and you know how I like bookends or inclusios as I put call, as it's called um, that that put ends to it but more than that I like uh, the and we're going to see inclusio for the whole book uh, of Genesis that is this chapter we see a chiastic structure and we're going to see even a deeper chiastic structure if you remember a chiasm was that there's like a point, we'll, we'll start with Leah, and then um, Bilhah and Zilpah, and then Zilpah, Bilhah, it's almost a, there's a reverse order that's happening, and then Rachel. And so generally in a chiastic structure of literature writing, uh, the central axiom where there, there's a shift is a, a very important message. Um, so we're going to hopefully discover that here, but I saw this and I thought, wow, that's pretty fascinating. Now, as they list Leah's children out first, this is, this is actually not a list that's given in the order of their birth. Um, you might think so, but it isn't. It's, it's, it's not. Um, uh, there are other places where it's in the exact order of their birth. Here it is in the order in which he is, he's blessing. And there's going to be groups of blessings, these stanzas that he is going to speak um, and, uh, well, you know, just, I thought it was fascinating. I think it's going to reveal something pretty cool about this book. Um, let's go ahead and dive in because there's more to say about, uh, Genesis here. Let's, let's dive in. Um, so Jacob is, is going to be on his deathbed. He has actually in the chapter before, I know it's been a while since we, we had our class, but in the class, in the chapter before he had blessed Ephraim and Manasseh. Um, and he had adopted them into his um, family as, as from Joseph. Joseph's children were Ephraim and Manasseh, and he adopted them as if, he, if, as if they were his own. All right, so let's just jump. First one, Then Jacob summoned his sons and said, Assemble yourselves that I may tell you what will befall you in the days to come. Gather together and hear. O sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. All right, so <clears throat> introduction to what the blessings are going to be or the words that he speaks over them. Um, here we see, O sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. Uh, I pointed out that, you know, we know that he had a name change, but he still goes by Jacob, and he also goes by Israel. Interestingly enough, in this chapter, Jacob is used five times, and Israel is used five times. They're used uh, in different places, but they are used equally, divided, uh, five and five, um, an expression. Sometimes, uh, again, I've said that Jacob perhaps has a leaning toward the, the fleshly or physical part of expression of Jacob, not always, um, and Israel to a more spiritual, not always. It has um, those connotations but uh, they lean in either way. It's a good uh, way. Why are they shifting between the two? Uh, sometimes it has to do with that, not always. Um, but there's something fascinating about this phrase, in the days to come. Now that's in Hebrew, decided to put it in here. Bacharit hayamin. So that means actually in the last days. It, it's not uh, in the days to come, uh, we probably think, well, what's going to come very shortly? Um, in the last days is a, a more accurate rendering of, of this phrase because it has to do with a greater picture, uh, a greater um, description. It's not like, oh, in the future this is going to happen. It has a, a it, it, is, it is a prophetic expression of what is going to come in the end times, basically in the last days, in the completion of, of, of all things, um, and says in the last days. Uh, and I think it's amazing how Genesis starts with in the beginning, verse one, Bereshit, right? 
in the beginning, from the very beginning. And at the end of the book, we hear him speaking and saying, in the last days, in when, when the last days come. Um, <clears throat> why would this be happening? Well, uh, it's, it's, it speaks to the nature of this book. We start with, in the beginning, God speaks all thing, things into creation. So there's a creative power to the word. And now as we finish the book, we're going to see an effectual prophetic power to the word uh, that is spoken through Jacob, a prophet here, as you will, um, prophetically speaking over the children as it is a completion, as it is a revelation of the truth that is going to be accomplished through these children. Now, if you recall, as we went through the book of Genesis, we start in the beginning, God creates, right? He creates all things. He puts man into the garden so that he might have a relationship with man, an intimate, loving relationship with man. Of course, uh, he places this tree in the garden, says, that's mine, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When he says, don't partake of it, um, man partakes of it. Uh, there is the fall, the consequences of his actions within the garden, uh, that separation of that beautiful relationship that had happened, the placing outside the garden and the going out. And, and we see as the, the book continues, the consequences of sin, the violence that uh, overwhelms the earth. Uh, the Lord saw the destruction, the end of man, and it was uh, violence and death and destruction. And so there was that flood and God renews the creation. And, and now he starts with uh, Noah and moves now to what Abraham and he becomes this picture of a restored relationship. God is now restoring that relationship to an individual. And he gives him a promise in Genesis chapter 12. What? I'm going to take you to a land I'm going to, that I will show you. I am going to give you a seed, a nation. And I'm going to bless you so that all the nations may be blessed uh, through our relationship. That restored relationship that we have with one another. And of course goes on to Isaac and then to Jacob. And as we culminate to the end of this book, to the children of Jacob, the tribes, the, the group of people. So we have individuals restoring, returning to a relationship with God, much revealed about how God works uh, within that developing relationship, what it means to walk in a world that is fallen, that is sin-filled or covered with the death, in essence, uh, what it means to walk that out and be in a relationship with God. And we see what God is trying to do or will do um, from the very beginning in, in Genesis chapter 3. We know that there is God speaks and says what to the serpent. Um, the, the, the man will crush, will, will bruise the head of the serpent. It was already a picture of what the Lord is going to do in the future redemption of all things, the restoration of all things, that repairing of the relationship. Well, he's doing that all through this book of Genesis, showing us a pattern, showing us his plan, and he is going to complete it or um, manifest it in the success or the faithfulness to his promise in Abraham into these sons, okay? So it is significant that at the end of this book, as we move into the book of Exodus, this, that's the, we're setting us up for the next book of Exodus, so that he shows us what his redemption looks like, what that restored relationship um, costs, in essence. Uh, that is the sacrifice, the lamb, and the, the Lord being revealed. He, he, of course, promises to redeem, and he does, and he fulfills. Um, but in the days to come, what the Lord is saying that he is, um, he has completed, he's come to a place through, this is through Jacob. He's come to a place that in these last days, as, as the sons of Jacob be who they are, that is the things that he's, he's going to pronounce over them, these blessings that are about to follow that we're going to be reading here in a second. Um, as those things come to pass, and they will um, in the last days, the, comp the, the promise will come true. So these, the fulfillment of these words, the expression of these blessings, 
are the last days expression of God accomplishing what he has set out to do. Um, I know you're thinking, well, uh, Rabbi Matthew, we're, what about the book of Revelation? It, it, things all haven't been completed. Well, stick with me and understand because God is saying through Jacob, and you'll, you'll see with the blessings that they are accomplished in the, in the, full, the filling full of this prophetic word, effectual uh, prophetic word that is being spoken over these individuals. In fact, when we look at these blessings, it's not, it's very hard to say, okay, uh, not think, well, perhaps they wrote this after the tribes were in uh, their land because they're so accurate in their description of their uh, uh, geographic location within Israel, the, the way they behaved and uh, lived out their life within the land. Remember, the Lord says you're going to go into this and possess a land, very significant for this um, promise and God's faithfulness. Um, and I'm going to bless you. And, and through that blessing, I'm going to provide a seed. And that will, and through this restored uh, relationship with God, as uh, presented through Israel, uh, all the nations will be blessed and ultimately, as we know, will enter into the kingdom of, of God, into the kingdom of heaven um, in, in what Yeshua does. Okay, um, so it's significant here. It, it is, it's, it's like those ending, in the beginning and in the final days. Uh, it's all summed up uh, and, and everything else, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, are an expression or a completion uh, or a description of the process, you know, a revelation of more depth to it. Here it is, uh, God is giving us the big picture. Um, he spoke everything into existence, the power of the creative word. And here he is speaking through the prophet Jacob. He's speaking through Jacob. Um, and saying and, and show and, and really in essence giving the power uh, of the prophetic word and demonstrating its effectual, its effectiveness. Thank you. Um, and back to what I was saying again about uh, people might think the, the word is somehow written later again because it was true and is true, and you can see the truth of it in every single stanza. Um, so we know that it was, this is the, re, the account of what the Lord spoke through prophet, th uh, through Jacob. Um, hopefully you got that. All right, so it's really neat. In, the day, in these last days, Genesis is almost in, in, um, in itself uh, a a unit where it can say in the beginning and in the final days. We often think, well, it's only the beginning. Well, he's, he's giving the picture of creation and ultimate redemption and restoration of relationship with God. All right. So now he begins with Reuben. Let's move on. Verse 3, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might in the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power, uncontrolled as water, you shall not have preeminence, but you went up uh, because you went up to your father's bed, you and then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. All right, so doesn't sound like much of a a, a blessing. I know that's why I would probably say uh, these are Jacob. This is these are the words that Jacob spoke over um, his sons. Um, their truths. Again, their. Uh, affirmations of things that have happened. If you recall, this this going up to the bed of Jacob was to sleep with Bilhah um, in Genesis 35, 22. And we read later on in Chronicles, this is why, uh, and we know here from this context, that he actually gave up his um, firstborn uh, place of significance, um, of importance. And it's it's, um, I don't know how I want to do this. Uh, uncontrolled as water. Uh, you can imagine that. 
Uh, it, it actually has a this uncontrolled word in Hebrew is like a frothy or boiling, uh, boiling up of water to overflow and uncontrolled kind of thing, um, chaotic, if you will, uh, thing. But it's a boiling up and then flooding over. And, and really what his, um, his transgression was, was that he violated his father's bed by coveting and taking um, something that wasn't his, that would be uh, Bilhah, Jacob's wife. And uh, this, to me, reflects the, the, uh, the problem of the Garden of Eden. If you recall uh, when I taught eons ago about the Garden of Eden and the purpose of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was in preparation for Eve to come into the garden and be in relationship uh, with Adam. Adam was the only one. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was there to say, okay, this is mine. God says, this is mine. Don't violate it. Uh, I love you. This is, you have access to everything. Uh, I lovingly give that to you and you can lovingly take but don't take uh, of this because it's mine. In essence, the respect of the other has learned part of, of love. And so in preparation for Eve, not taking from her uh, without permission, not taking uh, and just take, 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 a hedonistic approach to life had Adam been in the Garden of Eden and there was no tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, he would have been able to just take, take, take and almost uh, felt that the total existence of everything, that he was God, he created everything uh, for his own pleasure in, in a hedonistic sense. But God had a different plan. He wanted us to understand what true love was, what it is to give love and receive love. Um, and so that happens here. Reuben does not respect the other. He actually takes in this marriage of Jacob and Bilhah, they were joined in essence in a marriage and he violates that covenant. He violates um, that and he takes in, in the same way that you would think if you were to take Eve without her permission. If Adam had done something like that, it would be a violation. There was no respect of the other. So I found it fascinating that here, almost a lustful uh, parallel between the first blessing to Reuben and what happens with the fall of mankind or the um, broken relationship that occurs between man, Adam, and God in the garden. Now there's a broken relationship um, with Reuben and his father and a break in the line of succession, which is significant. Um, so I just thought that was very cool. There's a lot in here still preeminent in uh, dignity. He's, he's saying you were the firstborn, the birth of the fruit of the womb, uh, the strength of my uh, loins in essence. Um, you are the first, but because you could not control yourself, you took what was not yours. Uh, you did not respect or love your father in that manner. Um, just like that in the Garden of Eden. Um, sorry, not going to go that way. That's why there's going to be a second Adam. Adam was the first one. Yeshua being the second Adam. All right. Let's move on to Simeon. Same kind of thing that's happening here. It doesn't seem like a blessing, uh, but a stating of circumstances. Uh, Simeon and Levi. Uh, verse 5. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are implements of violence. Let my soul not enter into their counsel. Let not my glory be united with their assembly, because in their anger they slew men, and in their self-will they lamed oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will disperse them in Jacob. I will scatter them in Israel. All right, Genesis 34. We know that this is when Dina was uh, raped by uh, Shechem, taken by Shechem, um, the, the son of the city of Shechem. <laughs> um, he was a prince, but he took what he wanted. Um, Simeon and Levi, angry, 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 take vengeance upon uh, the inhabitants of Shechem. They do kill every, all the men. Uh, they take their spoils. They decimate the city. It's just uh, awful. Awful, awful thing. Jacob says, look, in your anger, uh, you went out and did this. Uh, you murdered these people. 
Um, and uh, they had they weren't expecting they thought we were going to be in this covenant relationship um, no 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 and, and it's interesting so they're he's like I, I'm disassociating how I do things disassociating how um, I uh, m Israel those that are part of uh, my blessing the words that I'm speaking uh, they will not enter into this kind of behavior. And he says, cursed be their anger. We often think, well, cursed, he cursed Simeon and Levi. Maybe he didn't, but he cursed the anger. He's, uh, this word cursed is kind of like a diminish. May it be um, small. And so he is, he is um, speaking this, that the anger, may it be diminished. May it um, be cursed. <laughs> it's a good word. Uh, may it be cursed. Um, and... In essence, as you read that, it's like um, those that behave in anger um, receive, uh, you know, this diminished um, expression, really. It, it says, I will disperse them in Jacob, J Jacob and I will scatter them in Israel. Um, interestingly, uh, this is just to tell you what's going to happen. Simeon and Levi do not receive land inheritance within uh, Israel greater Israel when they come into the land. Uh, of course, Levi is the, um, the, the, tri the tribes of priests, and the Lord doesn't, uh, they don't get uh, an inheritance of land. Uh, of course, their inheritance is of the Lord, which speaks of cursing turned into a blessing. They depend on the Lord. Some may not find that uh, so much a blessing not to have land or possession, uh, that kind of stuff, but theirs is now turned into a place of uh, of uh, relationship uh, in the priesthood with God, but they don't receive uh, the inheritance of the land, which is uh, what we're seeing a culmination of in Genesis. We're seeing the the land, the seed, and the blessing, uh, so that all might be blessed with them. Simeon does not, you don't see them get a land. They actually get dispersed within Judah. They disappear, kind of, they don't have their own, own land. Uh, we see that uh, Simeon actually uh, do, doesn't have the biggest uh, population. There's a lot that happens like after the wilderness. They had a big population. They went down to like 22,000 at the end. They had a decrease while well, most had an increase. Uh, so these guys uh, actually lose um, their independence because of this anger. They cannot, Simeon is dependent on others. They're dispersed into the into the land. Uh, Levi is dependent uh, upon the Lord, uh, great dependency, but as it relates to the land, their independence as it, as it comes has been spoken that it is going to be gone. So anger, incidentally, I would say, leads to a loss of independence, uh, as the Lord is trying to demonstrate here. Think back to now Cain and Abel. We just started with Adam and Eve. The first thing that happens uh, is that Cain kills Abel in a murder. Here, this is a, a, a picture of Simeon and Levi murdering in anger. They might uh, justify themselves as in righteous anger, but anger is anger, and you lose some type of independence in the sense that you, what, will um, be subject to your anger. I, I think that's the, a beautiful picture of what's happening. So Cain, what happens to Cain is that he uh, kills his brother and he is actually caused to wander the land. He was not to have any more land for himself. He had been a farmer and now he has to give that up and be a nomad. And the Lord says, you're cast out and uh, you're doomed to, well, you're, 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 your, where you're headed is just to wander the land as a nomad. Um, so parallels to me here with Simeon and Levi who were landless. Uh, Cain, and Cain became landless in his wandering, suffering from his uh, expression of anger, uh, his expression of uh, envy, uh, his expression of um, murder. And here they murder as well. So I thought that was an interesting um, parallel as we start with Reuben. Uh, we can see the lust, the lack of um, respect for his father uh, and the father's bride. And here the, the murder of your fellow man 
and the same picture as in Cain. Uh, so I don't think it's without coincidence that this is happening at the very beginning and giving us a picture of the um, last days even uh, because it's a revelation of the truth of all history and a recurring truth that, that comes up and up again. Um, so let's move on to the next one. This one is a little better. <laughs> Verse 8, this is for Judah. We're going to park here for a little bit and we're, we're really far behind. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down to you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From, from the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who dare rouse, dares rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor shall the ruler, ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him, or let's read that better, nor, uh, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. All right, we're going to dive into a bunch of stuff here, but before this happens, uh, the next event, I just want to go back to these connections to the beginning events of Genesis. Uh, we saw Reuben being connected with uh, Adam and Eve in the garden. We, we saw that Simeon and Levi connected to Cain. The next thing that happens here um, is that before the flood and the Tower of Babel and stuff, that Eve has a, a son. Eve has um, a Seth and then uh, there's Enosh. And this is the, a picture of she had the son, the hope um, of what the Lord had promised she saw was going to be completed through him. Uh, it is a picture of a new beginning and um, perhaps, uh, yeah, new beginning and um, a, a good expression of, of the Messiah in a picture of. All right. Oh, oh yeah, uh, that's a uh, new beginning why I was saying that. It was at this point when man began to call on the name of the Lord. And so there is a return, there is a picture of, of mankind calling and worshiping the Lord. Um, and generally when it says the call on the, uh, call on the name of the Lord, it is in a worshipable way, offer sacrifice, turn to him, give him praise. And so here when we start out with Judah, his name actually means praise. So we know uh, that the Lord is to receive praise, so, but it's very interesting how uh, in this uh, Hebrew it says you receive praise. should be, you know, um, reserved for the Lord, but in Judah, in the words spoken over Judah, there is almost a, a um, praise that is given to him from that of his brothers. A word of truth being spoken over, um, we know. Uh, we've got a little more information than people, a lot of people reading this, but we know that uh, there is, I've talked about it a number of times, Mashiach ben Yosef, Mashiach ben David. Ben David comes from the house of Judah, and the Mashiach ben Yosef was that suffering servant picture or always being persecuted, and uh, the Mashiach ben David, or from Judah, is that picture of a victory, the king, uh, the ruler, um, and of course, the lion of Judah, you've heard so many times. Well, here it says a lion's whelp, and that is a strong lion. It is a young, vibrant lion. Um, it's a picture here in verse 9. It says, from your prey. In other words, you have taken your prey. You're on your little perch where your little perch, your big perch where you're going to rest and uh, be accomplished. And nobody can take away from this powerful um, animal, anything that he has within um, his vicinity, and he can sit without um, worry. Uh, there's a reason they call him the, the king of the jungle. He is just supposed to be the, the highest predator, uh, but the, the one who cannot be touched, uh, <laughs> the one who rules, who can just feel at ease in the power. So this is a picture of power and uh, authority and supremacy uh, that is given with this lion picture. Um, and verse 10, we read, The scepter shall not depart from uh, Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. Self-evident, these are uh, pictures of authority, kingship, ruling, um, to be coupled with what happens with the lion's whelp. 
Uh, the verse eight, I didn't really say, but all of the enemies will flee from you. And that's to feed off of or inform us about the, the lion, that nobody is going to come and attack him uh, because he is the lion of Judah. Um, so the scepter and the, and the ruling staff uh, shall not depart from him. Um, why does it say between the feet? Because you see actually pictures in the, or sorry, pictures, <laughs> um, uh, depictions of rulers at the time. They had a staff and they'd hold it between their feet. It was a picture of authority, supremacy, and uh, power. Um, now this this next phrase, until Shiloh comes, you may have different translations of it. Uh, I can't go into all the different arguments for what this perhaps may mean. Um, but here it is being rendered as a, as a name. We know that in Israel there's a place called Shiloh. Um, we know that people and places can have the same name. In fact, in Genesis, we read that Enoch was born and they named a town Enoch. Uh, so it is uh, not uncommon for name, places to be named after individuals. Uh, same connection with them. Here we're seeing that Shiloh, I believe, is a place, a name, and an expression of, because uh, names have meanings, right? Um, and I'm just going to go with the, the best meaning here, Shiloh, to whom it belongs. Um, so reading in context, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until to whom it belongs comes, and to him shall all the obedience of, and to him shall be all the obedience of the peoples. So <clears throat> the one to whom this place belongs, the, the to whom belonging person, uh, you know, I know that Yeshua says, um, you have given me uh, all uh, these, uh, do not uh, allow them to fall. He, he lays claim, we are his when we are um, part of him. But this um, authority is what it's talking about. The authority um, of this Shiloh who comes to a place and um, also in a time to come. So important, what I think is pretty cool about this is Shiloh is an individual. So it's a, it's a name or a, a title of the Messiah. And in fact, uh, the rabbis, there's some, you know, gematria, the, each Hebrew letter kind of has a, a numerical value. And if you take um, Shiloh, the, the numeric value for that, and, and compare it to the numeric value for Mashiach, you actually come up with 300, what is it? I wrote it down. It's 300, somewhere I wrote it down. 358, um, which is the, they're both the same, which are, is neither here nor there, but uh, I believe this is a, a, a title of the Messiah. Uh, he is an individual who comes into reality place, so he redeems as this is, he rules over, sorry, rules over um, space uh, that is uh, a place, and he has authority over people, and it is in a time to come. So there is just a beautiful picture here of Shiloh, Shiloh, uh, being a title for the Messiah to one whom it belongs, that is, what? all authority, all power, um, and uh, he shall bring all peoples uh, into obedience uh, through both the offer for his rulership, and we read in scripture that there will be a time where every tongue and every, every tongue will confess and every knee will bow and say and declare him Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Um, so until that time and when it comes, this is... Uh, he will rule even until that final expression. This is where we can get acharit, um, the, the whole picture of uh, the end days in Judah, in this messianic uh, title, in this messianic expression. Uh, until then, these are the end days. It's all been said um, and completed and will be completed through Judah living out uh, this word spoken over them. And I don't wanna, I know I'm gonna be jumping back and forth, hopefully you're staking, staying with me. I'm gonna be jumping back and forth with future pictures, the application to the Messiah, but these are also uh, true prophetic words being spoken over these individual tribes. So when they live out their calling 
as Judah and as the tribe of Judah and the, the, the promises of God are then fulfilled in them and expressed through them. So it, it is a continuation of God's promise to Abraham through and in and um, about the children. Okay, <laughs> I'll leave it at that because that's what I mean. Um, so blessings continue on here. It's actually a long blessing for Judah. Uh, verse 11, he ties his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washes his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are dull from wine and his teeth are white from milk. Um, Judah was as a, as a um, well, first, let's go back to the Messiah. There's an interesting picture here of the fact of, of abundance. The fact that there is uh, wine, that he has the... Um, that wine is produced. Wine is a symbol of joy, and it comes out of, of Judah's land, actually, uh, in Israel. Uh, they were known for their wine and the wine press and uh, the abundance of it. Uh, so this joy will be uh, overflowing. It'll be an outcome of the product of their work. Uh, the fact that you can tie a donkey to a vine um, and not uh, worry that he is going to destroy it or even care because you have so much and the abundance is there is quite interesting just in this imagery. Uh, his eyes are dull from wine. It actually is bright. Uh, they are fiery. They are um, brilliant. Uh, so it is a picture of this healthy and happy and uh, joyous um, individual, healthy in all ways. Um, so uh, with that, this Shiloh, who rules this Judah, he, he has that as part of his essence, part of his being, um, being there. Uh, so picture of the Messiah, the ruling Messiah, supremacy, uh, authority, power, all shown and given to Judah at this point. Um, pretty cool. All right. Wow. All right. <laughs> we got a whole bunch. Zebulun will deal will dwell at the seashore, and he shall be a haven for ships, and his flank shall be toward Sidon. Issachar is a strong donkey, laying down between the sheepfolds. When he saw that a resting place was good and that the land was pleasant, he bowed his shoulder to, to bear burdens and became a slave at forced labor. All of these, just, I'm not going to be able to have time to go through all of them, but these guys... You can see the truth of their location, uh, their personality, the things that uh, came out in their expression in the land in these uh, this words of pronouncement over them. Uh, verse 16, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent in the, in the way, a horned snake in the path that bites the horse's heels so that his rider falls backwards. Uh, an interesting... Um, expression here, uh, serpent, he's going to be a judge. I want to point out this, this word, yadin, uh, judge. I know we think of it as you judge somebody in order to condemn them or put them in jail or that kind of stuff. Uh, but really, the word is meant as vindicate and actually is expressed more as vindicate. Put that down here. Uh, judge is a vindication of righteousness the the correctness the truth of something so a judge dan that's his name this is what the the name means it is to judge right so uh that's why there's play on word in the hebrew it's like so fun to see all these words linked together it's rhyme 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 um but dan shall judge his people it says if you want to read it in a way he shall vindicate his people in that he is going to judge in a just ma manner and um, bring out truth and righteousness is going to be revealed and um, that's exciting. We judge is shouldn't be always seen in a in a negative way because in the Lord's sense, especially when he judges at the end when we see him at the white throne of judgment, um, called he, he actually reveals who are his and who are not. So he lifts up the head. Oh, you've got my mark. Oh, you've got the mark of the beast. He's revealing he's in, uh, who is who. It's a positive thing that is showing 
and in essence for us, those that trust in him, vindicating our trust in him. And so when God judge, it's, it's for vindication, for the revelation of righteousness and truth. Um, and there's something create, very interesting that happens in this um, particular, well, just jumps out. Verse 18, for your salvation I wait, O Lord. It's grouped together here with Dan and uh, a lot of the stanzas that you would see people or strophes that people would write or, or uh, render. Um, I've pulled it out here because it's almost like an explanation. Uh, I, he, he just blurts this out. Um, For your salvation I wait, uh, O Lord. yud heh vav the the tetragrammaton here. Um, for your salvation, Yeshua, that's in the Hebrew, for your Yeshua, I, I wait. It's almost as if he is, he knows that these days are coming and he, he can almost, he can't really even uh, hold it in. Uh, he blurts it out within this, this section of, of Dan where he says, Dan, you'll vindicate all of Israel. Um, how is that, how is that relevant um, what is happening here? Well, this is what I feel. If you recall, right here, Jacob speaks over his sons, right? And I said there was this chiastic structure to uh, the blessings that are coming out. Leah, Bilha, Zilpah, Zilpah, Bilha, and Rachel, right? Well, let's break this down into uh, the different actual tribes and names of the sons. You see here, I've got them all listed, and this we haven't gone to the, the ones at the end, but this is how they're listed in their blessings, and you're going to notice that Dan is right here in the middle. Here's our chiastic. What is the point? What is the, the um, significant part with it? All of it's significant, right? But what is something that's super important that we should... Uh, spend some time thinking about. Well, it's right in there in the middle. So we see that uh, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Z Zebulun, and Issachar. So we've got those guys listed and there's five stanzas prior, five blessings or five pronouncements that are, uh, are given. And we're going to find out that there are five pronouncements that are going to come after. And so Dan is directly in the middle. Remember, I said that Israel appeared five times and Jacob appeared five times. I don't think it's without um, mistake that God's word is just amazing. So five and five, Dan right in the middle. And of course, what in, oh, those, I thought this was fascinating, too, with Simeon and Levi. Why, why are they bunched in the same thing? Well, they, they're brothers. They are attached in, in their behavior. And I thought it was fascinating that we are going to read about Joseph, but we know that Joseph consists of Manasseh and Ephraim, right? So it's almost as if they're reflected here, you know, Reuben 1, uh, Simeon and Levi 2, and then um, there's 11, 10, Joseph and Ephraim uh, and Manasseh, how, how those all work out in a chiastic expression, almost very, very balanced in essence. Um, but Dan being in the middle, what is he? He's what he's going to vindicate. There's vindication within this, this discussion. And what is the, the word that, is, that that leads to? Salvation. Verse 18, salvation. Verse 16, the, the context of vindication. So as the Lord vindicates and, and works in a way that in these future time, there is going to be a vindication, Yadin, of those. And in the vindication, there is salvation. There is always this heart and call from David when he is, Lord, come to my rescue. Vindicate me in the sight of my enemies. The, the, the voices of the martyrs under the throne of God are, are speaking for vindication that, that the truth of what God has accomplished and what they died for would come to complete fruition uh, for not only their benefit, oh, I want vengeance. No, they, the benefit of the world, the fact that they, they lived a life that was true, that their their lives given to the Lord ultimately for a martyr completely and utterly is vindicated and that salvation is realized 
uh, for all those who know what it is to give up their life. And so I think it's give up their life for the Lord. Uh, pretty cool to me. Um, and we've got to rush, rush, because I want to spend a little time with Joseph. Um, but you see that? I think it's pretty cool. Uh, that's that structure. Uh, salvation. He's, he's calling out, Lord, I want to see it. I want to feel it. I want to know it. I want to know your Yeshua. I want, to, I want that to be the reality. And, and this is the Spirit of the Lord speaking through Jacob as he talks about this end time, this in the last days. Um, I've, I think it's significant and even informing us how to read the book of Revelation. Um, I'm doing a little study on my own with that book, but it is a uh, reality of the end days, of what we find ourselves in, where uh, as the gospel, because it says of the gospel of Yeshua Mashiach, Yeshua the Messiah, um, is, is here in the book of Revelation in a very pictorial way. Um, maybe I'll do a study with you guys with that, but the same thing is happening here at the end of the book of Genesis. It's almost like a, a book of revelation or a word of revelation as he is expressing the truth that is going to be fulfilled through uh, these individual words that are being spoke to, spoken over them, uh, the effectual power of the prophetic word spoken through Jacob. All right. Um, <clears throat> verse 19, continuing, As for Gad, raiders shall raid him, but he will raid at he will raid at their heels. As for Asher, his food shall be rich, and he will yield royal dainties. Naphtali is a doe let loose. He gives beautiful words. Um, agri uh, geographical, very accurate. Uh, I encourage you to look at him on your own. Um, Joseph, verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a spring. Its branches run over a wall. The archers bitterly attack him and shoot at him and harass him, but his bow remained firm and his arms were agile from the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. All right, Joseph. We know this blessing would be spoken over Ephraim and Manasseh, but Joseph being that picture of Mashiach ben Yosef, the suffering servant we, he, we see here, an interesting thing, it's almost as if he, okay, so he's going to be fruitful. He's going to be bountiful, the, the product of, of who he is. Uh, the tribe's going to be big, but uh, even picturing of in the, the messianic expression, uh, the bountiful overflow of the increase of those that are his and in his kingdom and saved through him. But there are archers bitterly attacking him, that suffering servant. There is going to be a warfare kind of that sur surrounds um, Joseph uh, and even the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, they're engaged in constant conflict Not, and some of the other ones, and I didn't dwell on those. Um, but here we see that there is going to be a continual harassment. You think as if those that have been brought into the fold through the Messiah um, he says, you know, if they persecute you, it is because they are after me. And the Messiah is this picture of this continual harassment, the Mashiach ben Yosef, continual harassment of the, of the, um, the suffering servant uh, of Joseph. They're continually after him. Unlike Judah, who has this complete supremacy and authority uh, here, there is this harassment that is going to be this fight almost that they're continually uh, found themselves in, but you are so fruitful and bountiful, and in fact, uh, you get you you never falter because of the mighty one of Jacob. Now, this is a unique title, and of course, they're speaking about God, the Heavenly Father, um, of well, God here, uh, Elohim Yudhebavhe, um, the the mighty one of Jacob is the one that strengthens uh, your defenses, the the ability you won't waver. Um, because of that reliance on him, the, the power given by him, uh, the protection here, a shepherd, one that protects the, the sheepfold. Uh, the, the, you know, Jacob was a, sh a shepherd, uh, and he acknowledged the Lord as, as his shepherd, the one who guided him into safe pastures and also protected him from uh, the uh, ravenous 
animals that would take uh, advantage of this uh, flock. Uh, he preserved their life. And the stone of Israel, a stone, of course, uh, unshaking. You can't help but think, Evid, this stone, this picture of uh, the stone the builders had rejected, uh, that referring to Jesus, Yeshua, uh, those when he came um, did not want to receive uh, the Messiah, uh, the suffering servant, uh, and they're rejecting this stone, taking us right back to the fact that uh, Joseph has relied completely, this picture of the suffering servant relies and is uh, the cornerstone, the stone of Israel, the stone, uh, the assurity of, of God's people being God himself, okay? Uh, I hope you understand what I'm saying. Um, but, oh yeah, I just highlight that. Awesome, awesome stuff. So a picture of this suffering servant who never, f fruitful and um, on the increase all the time, yet harassed uh, and yet uh, assured because of the mighty one who provides for Jacob, the shepherd who always guides us and protects us, and the for sure, Evid, the, the permanency, the no doubtness of the rock of Israel. Okay. Um, continuing with Joseph's blessing 25 from the God of your father who helps you, and by the Almighty Shaddai, that word, uh, Almighty, you who bless you with blessings of the heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the beasts of the, or the breast and of the womb. The blessings of your father have surpassed the blessings of my ancestors up to the uppermost bond of the everlasting hills. May they be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of his head <clears throat> of the one, and on the crown of his head of the one distinguished among his brothers. So much happening here, um, but the God of my fathers, he's saying, look, the one almighty Shaddai, the one who has provided that blessings, uh, may they just overflow uh, from heaven. He says blessings, that would be that rain coming down, the water coming up from underneath, the growth uh, that is provided by that, this whole imagery of verse 25 is the Lord sustaining all things. I've pointed out many times that Israel is sustained by Geshem, the rain that comes down from heaven, uh, dependent on God completely. And he's saying, you will uh, experience blessings beyond the blessings that I have ever experienced uh, because of uh, what God is doing, the Almighty, the provider is doing for you. And that uh, in, in the sustenance that reigns, the um, from the earth and even from the product of your offspring and in in so many ways so the lord is is saying the abundance will be uh, so much and i encourage you today to realize that as we follow our lord and engage uh, and accept um, mashiach ben yosef the messiah uh, our, our suffering servant. It isn't all doom and gloom. The fact that, yes, there are things that are coming after you, but the Lord says you will, uh, uh, Joseph will, and through him, because of him, you will experience the overflow of these blessings. Um, the blessings of your father shall surpass. I already said that. Um, may they be on the head of Joseph um, and on the crown of his head. Uh, that he would be distinguished from his brothers. And of course, that is significant in the coming of the Messiah, the distinct individual who comes as a representative, as the perfect Israelite expressed in Yeshua, in Jesus, in his birth and in his coming as the suffering servant and his raising from the dead. It is, wow, just spoken over them from the very beginning. Potent. All right, Benjamin, 27. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, he devours the prey, and in the evening, he divides the spoil. From morning to evening, all throughout, it's, an, it's a non-ending. Uh, this guy's got uh, tenacity. He's got endurance. Uh, he's just not going, to, not going to stop. Interestingly enough, Paul is from the tribe of Benjamin. I would say he was pretty uh, non-relenting unrelenting, excuse me, um, uh, in the way that he approached his um, desire for the Lord and the expression of it. Uh, 
numerous things uh, to, to talk about. Uh, we're running short on time and I, I want to keep us focused. Verse 28, uh, this is at the end. The blessings have happened. Uh, Jacob has spoken all the words over his children. Verse 28, all these, these are the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is what their father said to them when he blessed them. He blessed them, everyone, with a blessing appropriate to him. Um, so all of them receive the blessing. It is a, a uh, almost a, a universal expression here in verse 28. And now uh, I'm going to jump down to verse 33. But in those uh, verses, read them. They are just talking about just. They're talking about uh, Jacob asking to be taken up to be buried with um, his wife and with Abraham and Sarah in the land, which they will do here uh, shortly. Um, and the promise, of course, he he already had Joseph promise to do that in the previous chapter, but he is reestablishing it here uh, in this context. Verse 33, we end with this. When Jacob finished charging his sons, he drew his feet into his bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. So I, I wanted to include this because, okay, so it's very sad. Um, Jacob uh, is, is passing away. And if you recall, Jacob says to Pharaoh when they're having a little conversation, I'm I'm 137 years old and I've had a terribly hard life. I, I don't know why I talk like that. But he, he really didn't say very, he's, it's been rough. They, my days have been few. Uh, the turmoils have been uh, tough and not good. But the Lord does something very sweet here. Uh, he, he doesn't, we don't read that he died. We know that he died because he was gathered to his, his um, people, to his fathers, to his, to his people. Uh, it says, Vaya Sof, as opposed to Vayamot. Uh, Vaya Sof is that he drew up his feet. Vayamot is he died. And generally we read it, that. And so it jumps out and says, okay, something else happened here. He drew up his feet almost in a very peaceful manner. Instead of saying, oh, he's dead, it says he drew up his feet into his bed and almost, and he, and he drew his uh, last breath um, and was gathered to his people. It is a, is a peaceful end to a man who said, you know, it was pretty rough. Um, and he speaks from the Lord, which I thought was cool, amazing. Well, we all think that. The prophetic word is given, and um, he ends his life in a peaceful place uh, without doubt, trusting that his sons would fulfill the, the oath that they said that they would take him to the land, and that his, his time, his, his witness, his life uh, has come to now that he is going to see the Almighty. Uh, so I thought that was a beautiful end and for Jacob, who, who did have it a little rougher than Abraham and, and Isaac, for sure, uh, given, go read it. He had a lot more uh, turmoil um, and a lot more <laughs> gray hair uh, than, than probably his, his parents. I don't know if they had gray hair. So, all right, I did kind of speed there at the end, but it was so that um, we would get to this. Um, and that is that God is awesome. I really love this chapter. Uh, again, there's a lot. It's poetic. It's beautifully written. Uh, the, the fact that God reveals stuff just in the structure of, of how he writes something and conveys it. Uh, that, that the consistency and the, just how amazing he put this book together. I mean, you start with in the beginning, right? Bereshit, in the beginning, God created through the word. Now we're having a word, uh, uh, yeah, um, in, in the end days, in the last days, uh, that, that the Lord is giving this full picture. And to me, it's like the full picture of the Bible. <laughs> because in the fruition of these words, this word that is spoken over his sons, 
salvation comes to the, to the world. In their living it out, and, and how do I know this? Well, we're going to see that God fulfills it again with Israel. He is going to place them in, uh, they're already in Egypt, and uh, they're going to be in this um, period of captivity. But the Lord is going to say, look, it's done. I'm going to free you. Uh, I am going to come and deliver you. Uh, and I'm going to, do, to um, reveal who I am. I'm going to vindicate you and bring you salvation. Uh, it is, it's amazing. The same is true. It's, it, it's over and over and over again in Scripture. The Lord uh, gives us the basics here in Genesis. He says, look, I created you to be in a relationship with me. Uh, things went a little awry in that relationship. But you know what? It is all learning about love and, and how to love and who to love and who to respect. And I want to restore that relationship. And this is how I'm going to do it. I, I'm going to enter and, and reveal myself. Uh, to you, to the individual, and I'm going to bring you along with these promises that I have said to you that I will do for your life. I have accomplished for you. And in this, um, actually, in the individual individuals' lives of Genesis, uh, they all experience the Lord and that return, well, they all, the, the ones that we're reading about, uh, returned relationship. But in the process, they learn about themselves and learn about the Lord. Uh, they're here for a purpose, not just so that, uh, you know, they're going to go to heaven, um, but they are. The, the purpose is here to be in that relationship uh, with him while you're here. And in this whole picture, in, in all of these words, in all of this book, all that happens and I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> all that happens, and it is an expression of salvation in and of itself. So the Lord, in bringing us through, bringing these people through these accounts, um, is developing and showing us His ways and His Yeshua, His salvation. Um, he is our salvation. Uh, and as this chapter, I think, points out, our vindication uh, in placing our trust in Him, knowing that His end goal is for the salvation, for the blessing of the whole world. Uh, he doesn't hold back. Uh, he pours out His blessings upon us. Uh, he, it is amazing, and it's been said from the very beginning. Um, and these, these, chat, these, these verses are an expression of, of God's plan ultimately completed in the Messiah. All right. With that, let's pray. Wow. Lord, it was, it is an awesome thing. Your word, your perfect word, how you just express over and over again so many different ways your heart for us, your desire to be in a relationship with us. The, the concern that you have for us as individuals and us as a creation altogether, as your mankind, as uh, the universe that we live in. Uh, I am in awe of what you do and, and your ways, your, your word, and how amazing it is, how perfect it is, how precise it is, and how expressive and dynamic it is for us that, Lord, uh, you spoke all things into creation uh, and that the, the expression of that is tangible. Your word is alive and real, foundational. It is, and that is truth. It is sturdy. It is found. And, uh, the, and to see it in these final chapters as um, a, uh, an assurity of, of what is to come a declaration, uh, a revelation of your faithfulness and uh, a affirmation uh, and a, of your commitment to a restored relationship with us. And so, Lord, I thank you. I ask, Lord, that you would continue to minister this word to each and every one of us as we go through this week, this weekend, 
um, and this weekend, uh, week to come. Uh, we bless you. We love you. We honor you. Uh, we, we offer our praise and our awe to you through your mighty Son, uh, the, the Rock of Israel, uh, the Shepherd, uh, the, the Mighty One, uh, <laughs> Shiloh. Uh, we bless you and Yeshua is in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we'll be in chapter 50 next week. And thanks for joining me tonight. Uh, God bless.